This is the Bob Cordaro Show on TV. They fought for us, now he'll fight for you. The pursuit of justice and liberty. It's the Bob Cordaro Show on TV. Rebecca Martino is the owner of Stately Pet Supply, a unique pet store experience in Clark Summit. Rebecca is also a vocal advocate for a local business and buying local. We're joined with our regular monthly segment uh, by Rebecca Martino, the owner of Stately Pet Supplies. And I always learn a lot from you, Rebecca. I really do. So <laughs> I love it. And, and so now we've talked about at health. Mm -hmm. In the future, we're going to delve into this store we call Stately Pet Supply because I love it up there. I'd love to have you up. But uh, today, you, you, you wanted to talk a little bit about diabetes and, and maybe some other sort of insidious diseases mm -hmm. that, uh, and chronic things that our pets deal with. Mm -hmm. So um, this idea came to me that it's a great topic to focus on. It came to me a, a few weeks ago when I had a call from a customer who felt um, that after their pet was recently diagnosed with diabetes, they left the vet's office with wishing they just had a bit of a better understanding. So um, what I like to say that I bring to the industry is my nursing background. I'm a registered nurse. I, I don't practice currently because I already work seven days a week at the <laughs> store, so I just can't. But I'm a registered nurse and I have over seven years experience. So. Um, what I like to say I bring is, you know, um, with diagnostics and the care you receive at a veterinarian's office, um, they can kind of pass the ball to me uh, in a secondary nature, and I can continue the education and the direction on how to find diabetes-appropriate foods or treats, things like that. Sometimes there's just not enough time in a vet's office to go into everything and create a oh, thorough understanding. Three hundred pets there. It, it, the and you want to, and then yeah. your dog or cat is going after somebody else or running from somebody. <laughs> yeah. It's not the place it, to it have is, this discussion. It, the, the veterinary industry this these days is incredibly overwhelmed. Isn't even the word. The ratio of companion animals to professionals is so the 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 differences are so vast that there's just not enough time in the day to uh, see everyone. And sometimes, as the provider, you you just can't spend the time you wish you could. Um, to be with your customers. So um, that's why I like to fill that little niche. I bring my nursing background, and so we'll talk about diabetes. In this case, it's something that works very similarly in pets as it does to humans, right? Mm -hmm. So at all times, our brains need oxygen and sugar. So sugar, glucose, we'll, we'll, they'll be synonymous here. You can't have too little, you can't have too much. Too little or too much cause changes too much you get what's called an acid base imbalance and we'll spare you all those technical details but too little or too much is a problem so we like to keep it 80 to 120 is is about what textbooks teach us these days and it works the same in pets as humans so whether you have an insufficient amount of insulin coming from the pancreas or you have a resistance to its use in the body for whatever reason, that's what diabetes is. It's an uncontrolled amount of sugar kind of floating around having a party in the body. So anytime we eat a carbohydrate, whether it's rice, potatoes, wheat, corn, uh, lentils, garbanzo beans, anytime you have a starch of some sort, our body converts it into a sugar. Now it's time for our pancreas to say, hey, there's a little too many of you guys going on here. Mm -hmm. Let's send out the hormone insulin to grab the extras, mm -hmm. not too many, but grab the extra and bring them into the cells, kind of like a little bit of a gatekeeper. In textbooks, you, it's, it's kind of, there's actually a lock and key diagram that says this extra sugar goes into the cells and it can then be stored and used as energy. And, um, you know, insulin does a couple more things, but that's basically it. So when you have too much, your pH can get very acidic. That's a very dangerous thing over the course of our lives. It can uh, be the reason that we lose feeling in our fingers and toes. Mm -hmm. Same things for dogs. Anyway. Well, if I have a pet, mm -hmm. how, how do I detect this? How do I know enough to take my pet to the vet mm -hmm. to discover if they may have an underlying condition like diabetes? 
Okay, signs and symptoms of diabetes are very much like people also. Uh, when the sugar is not getting to where it's supposed to go, it kind of spills over and it can be found in the urine. Um, it can create extra urine, which creates extra thirst. So extra uh, changes in the bladder patterns and excess thirst. Um, the cells are not getting the energy that the insulin would otherwise deliver. Mm -hmm. So now the dog's appetite can actually go up. And where obesity is a risk factor, weight loss, unexplained weight loss, is actually a sign that you've developed diabetes. You're peeing off your calories instead of having them utilized otherwise like they're supposed to be. So you can see lethargy. Your dog's energy is just blah, things like that. So mm -hmm. that's a sign to definitely get to your vet if you see one or all of those symptoms. Well, my cat is naturally lethargic. <laughs> what, do I right. do? what do I do with them? <laughs> so if you're poking <laughs> at them, never then what you do with me. <laughs> that's, no, <laughs> no, cat. that's never mirror their yeah. their owners. Um, so if you have um, if you have an animal experiencing anything like this, it's my favorite thing to do is to look at the diet. So after you go through the diagnostics and the medical management with the veterinarian, I can talk to you about. Um, how to find the most appropriate foods. In dry food, which is very common in dro uh, dogs and cats, dry food is obligated to have a lot of starches. Mm -hmm. You cannot make a dry food without a lot of starch. So whether it's a grain-based or grain-free, grain-free is a very generic term you'll see in pet food. In dry food, grain-free just means you need a starch, but it won't be from a grain. So instead, they'll use peas, potatoes, lentils, things like that can be very high carbohydrate diets. So I like to bring customers in the store and talk about how can we lower the carbohydrate exposure for dogs and then lessen their need for all the extra insulin. Um, that's, uh, that's one of my favorite things to do. That, uh, and that's a big deal. It's important. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you always think about you just don't want your pet to suffer. Right. You don't want them. You want them to have a good quality of life. And, uh, Rebecca, thank you very much for bringing this to us. It's a, uh, it's a big subject. It is definitely. Yeah. yeah. Rebecca Martino, Stately Pet Supply. Thanks. Road Scholar Transport, a higher standard. Great. Good morning, everyone. Our uh, Road Scholar Transport uh, Power Player of the Week is Jerry Prosciutti. This is, a, this is someone that I knew and looked up to since, actually, since I'm in grade school. <laughs> I, I, I don't know if that dates him or me or both, but he was the coach at Mid Valley High School when I was playing high school football. And he was just really well-respected uh, started the Pine Forest football camp, all those things. And he's done so many things for so long, so well, uh, that I said, uh, I ran into him and I said, I've got to have you on this show. And uh, Jerry Prosciutti, welcome. Bob, thank you very much. I appreciate it. Yeah. It's an honor to be here. Uh, it's, it's great to have you. And I, I, let's, let's start from the beginning, Coach. Tell, tell us where you were born. Tell us a little bit about your family background. I was born in Peckville, Pennsylvania. In 1943, uh, I had a great, great parents, my mom and dad. Uh, we, we went to Blakely High School. Uh, my dad was a coal miner, and I learned so much from him. I, you know, a hard work ethic, yeah. how to treat people right, not the alibi. But unfortunately, he passed away when I mean, he was only 49, but he was, uh -huh. he, he was a tremendous person. Plus, he was a coach. He coached major football, baseball, and basketball in the town. Well, now he was not from Italy. He, no, he, second, he, gener he's second generation. Second generation. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Your grandparents came over. Yep, grandparents were from over there in the Gubbio area. But yeah, it's, uh, I grew up in a great town, Peckville, yeah. Pennsylvania. Blakely Pennsylvania. High School was a great area to be brought Lockenberg up. Bear wasn't there when you played, was he? Absolutely. Oh my gosh, he was my head coach, and then Coach <laughs> Hanses, his son, who unfortunately passed away was his first job as an assistant in 1960. So I had both coaches. No, you had Jack Hens's for yeah, your coach. Yeah, he was an assistant coach to his dad. Another thing we share in common. In 1960, <laughs> yeah, he coached wow. you, obviously. Wow. Yeah, so it was a, a tremendous group. Of great growing up in that community. People well, cared about each other, took yeah. care of each other. So it was, worked really well. When, when you talk about Jack Hens's, 
he not only coached you, he coached me, he coached my oldest son and my youngest son. So yeah, there's longevity. He coached there. everybody. <laughs> <laughs> Plus he's godfather for one of our sons, yeah. Jerry. So that's great. We're, we were close. Well, uh, and and yeah, we we lament his loss. Uh, oh, without question. Oh, yeah, the funeral, sad stuff, but uh, but great life. Oh, without question. Now, getting back to your great life, <laughs> so you're a you're a star at uh, Blakely, and I played well. That was... that that leads to college football. Well, I got that scholarship to Temple. I was recruited by Tennessee, Virginia, and Buffalo. Wow, I had three offers, not even Temple. But I played in a dream game. And the coach named Wally Porter, after the game, came in and offered me a full scholarship. I didn't apply to Temple. I didn't know, you know the coach. I didn't know anything. I'd never been in Philadelphia. And I had to make a decision Monday. But there was a, games were always on Friday night. So uh, I, my dad, Coach Cordelli, and Dr. Cocodrilli made the decision for me to go to Temple. On Monday, I had a, my dad drove me in this, this car we had. I wasn't sure if we were going to make it to Philly. Uh, the camp in, uh, outside of Broadheadsville. I met the coach, drove to Philly, applied, got in right there, walked up the street. <laughs> it was that quick. Got up the street, <laughs> found my dorm, and drove back. It was that quick. I mean, that's old school. That's old school. <laughs> but there was no, I mean, I went in and put a 533 code on my application. It was in and done. And my father really was crying walking up Broad Street because yeah. I was the first to go to college for my family. Wow. So it was a special moment with my dad. My dad was an unbelievable person. He just always had me involved. I was the mascot at Blakely from 1948 to 1951. I used to run out in front of the kids at Blakely. <laughs> As a bulldog? As, no, I don't know what he had. A well, they uniform were Blakely bulldogs. Or not, I thought that, that was that time. the name. <laughs> it was just Blakely then. Okay. But, but yeah, I got that scholarship at the Temple, and that started everything, really. And that, I mean... It was as big a deal then, that scholarship, well, as it ever could be now. Without question, because my father being a coal miner, we would not have, he would not have had the funds to send me to college. And, and I got that scholarship. And that's why I got to college, because I'm not handy. People who know me know I don't have a hammer, <laughs> and I'm not good at anything like that. So I was very fortunate and humbling to get that scholarship. But, yeah. Out of the clear blue, because I was going to Buffalo that Monday. Because I, you know, I knew yeah. a coach up there, Bob Demig was the coach, recruited me. They flew me down to Tennessee. I was in Virginia. Tennessee was too far. And, uh, and that's how I ended up at Temple. So Temple was good, strong football program. We, had a, we were the beginning of building back Temple, correct? Mm -hmm. And uh, we did very well with Temple. And then what happened, in, uh, after my senior season, I was getting a trial with the Philadelphia Eagles, and we were negotiating. Uh, they were going to pay me sixteen hundred dollars a week to go to Hershey, Pennsylvania. I didn't own a car, and Coach Backus was sitting me. There's no lawyers at the time. Yeah, and he said, "Why don't you come coach with me at Temple?" I got up and walked out. I was 21 years old. So that's what I started at Temple. I was 21 years old coaching. Instead of going try the out trials. Yep. How about that. Yeah, I just. And did you ever? Did you ever regret that? Uh, I look back. You know, I do look back sometimes. Regret? No, I have no yeah. regrets. But I do look back because you always wonder, could you have made it? But then, you know, I was able to play. It was pretty quick, you know, and all that stuff. But uh, I don't regret anything. I just got going to Temple and then start coaching there. For, you know, I coached there for four years. Recruit a lot of guys like Joe Mesco, Billy Anzalone, you know, guys that you're familiar with. Yeah. And, uh, and you're, you're lifelong friends with them, and the Temple guys question. really stick. I love yeah, that. Yeah, we are very close friends with those people, yeah. and, uh, especially Joe Mesco. You know, mm -hmm. recruited him out of the dream game, Yeah, actually. And, uh, but Temple was the key for me. It, it, it kicked off everything. How long did you serve as coach at Temple? Four years. Oh, boy. Yeah, I was there for four years before, before I came back to Mid-Valley to start the program. But when I was at Temple, we started our camp. That was in 19, what was 23, 1968 was our first football camp. Oh, my. And, uh, and then 1970, we started the cheerleading camp. But the key to my camps was my wife, Kaki. When she came, when we were at the shore, run on a football convention with our defensive coordinator in Wildwood Crest, New Jersey in 1969. There was a lady sitting at the pool with my wife talking about a cheerleading camp. I think her name was Mary Verney, actually. And Kaki, that's her name, yeah. uh, said, 
said, well, maybe we should start a camp next year. So 1970, we started a camp. So you already had the football camp, the famous Pine Forest football yeah, camp. Yeah, for 44 years. You know, you've been there. You, you were a part yeah. of it. But uh, she was the heart of the cheerleading camp for 16 straight years. She did everything. She registered, sold the pizza, did the hospital runs, security. <laughs> you had to say a lot about her because, and you, well, obviously, and the family, was, but because this is 1970. Oh, yeah, yeah. There weren't opportunities for girls like there were for boys no, back then. No, definitely not. Mm -mm. It you was created a, one. Yeah, we created that environment. Uh, but our, it, see, the difference with our camp, we're a family-run camp. Both my sons, Jerry and Craig, are very involved, right? But she was the key, and she did it for 16 straight years until they got old enough to help me out. Yeah. But uh, she really was uh, the key to it. And then, you know, we started that girls' basketball camp in 1972 for 20 years. So we had the football with the cheerleaders and the girls' basketball going. And then 1976, we had a tennis camp with Mike Strong was running it for From us. The University of Scranton. Scranton, yeah. yeah. And uh, so we ended up with four camps, but as things kept going, the charity kept getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And, uh, and now we're at three locations, but it started at Temple when we had that idea to yeah. run that football camp. Actually, we were at a, a football convention with all the local coaches up in Binghamton, New York. It was uh, over St. Patrick's weekend. And there was a guy named Bob Buckenavage there. It would be 1967, 68 actually. And uh, he was talking about, uh, he worked at a camp called Pine Forest as a counselor in the summer. Now, he played with me at Temple. He was two years older. And I said, where's Pine Forest? I said, that's right with Lake Wallen Pop Pack. So it was, it was a Monday. I told all those, those coaches, all the local coaches, and you know them all, if you guys want to get involved, give me a call. And no one called. So I met Mr. Black on that Monday. And the Carol Huntress and Bill Yeomans, he was the head coach of Bucknell, were looking at it the week before. They were big time guys. I was just a kid. Yeah. He calls me on Thursday and gave me the camp. First thing I did, I knew we needed a name and knocked on Chuck Benayak's door, the all pro. I found out where he lived. My wife was in the car, our son Jerry. And I, I knocked on the door. He came to the door. He filled the door. It was really rough. <laughs> I got to meet him a number of times. Yeah, you know yeah. that. And uh, yeah. I told him what I wanted and he came. And that started it. Wow. Yeah. That, that's. I mean, that's a real headliner. He's the last two-way guy in the NFL, yeah, Chuck Frank, He knocked Frank Gifford out. Yeah, two -way that famous pro. picture. But I knew I needed a, a name. You know, obviously I had Coach Peter Kuski, Coach Hensis, Coach Cordelli. I used to have the brochure. And, uh, yeah. But I needed a name. And I really didn't know what I was doing, to tell you the God's truth. I yeah. just, just started. How many kids the uh, first time? Thir for 37 kids and 12 coaches. Wow. Next year we had 190. So I knew. We were on to something. You got it. And then the cheerleading uh, started with 85 girls, and now we have literally thousands, as you know. Yeah. And from everywhere. Is it, It's not just a local camp. No, we get 95% of our local teams, but we get children from uh, 12 states. We get a team coming from Florida, uh, Team Minnetonka High School flies in from uh, Milwaukee and Minnesota, and then any every state from Virginia to, up to Vermont. I mean, this, that's called economic development there. <laughs> it was, yeah. It, 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 it became a very uh, good business, but, it, but it's a very, when I look back on where I'm from, it's truly, truly humbling. And the key to our success is that we are a family-run camp. Yeah. And there's no other, there are no other cheerleading camps in the country where it's just a pursuity family. It was my wife and I'm both my sons. So it's a family camp. And we provide an environment that they can't get anyplace else. Yeah. Yeah, we, yeah. And, and you're talking about logistics when this this many kids feeding them, entertaining them, making sure they don't make trouble. Uh, oh, yeah. You know, There's all of those things. That's checking that's checking them in, checking them out. And, yeah. uh, you know, hiring about 150 staff from all over the country. We have we have instructors from all over the country that come in. So it's a, it's very uh, humbling. I mean, I look back. I I'm just Jerry from Peckville, and yeah. I know where I'm from. The son of a coal miner, had great parents, and mother is real good. And uh, you know, I'm just just humbling to, to have this opportunity yeah. to have some success and be in the situation we're at right now. Yeah, because this pine forest is it has grown. Although the football camp now we, is, is no longer. We right? stopped. We did that for 44 years. But what happened as cheerleading got bigger and bigger and bigger, we're no. We had a 
we're no longer at one location. We're at two other uh, facilities, Trails Inc. Camp, a camp called Chestnut Lake. And it just got overwhelming. I couldn't do all the camps. Mm-hmm. And then my son, Craig, he took the camp over after the 30th year. And I went to both my sons. I said, well, you guys got to take this over because I can't keep doing this. And Craig took it over. And actually, he probably made it better because he could get all those coaches, the Keith Olson, or yeah. Marichak, Coach Donato, all those coaches, Coach Hens's, they brought their teams there. Yeah. And then, well, you know, you were there. Yeah. But when you were there. And they, my kids, too. Yeah, and your sons. But Generational. When, when you were there, there were all coaches from all over the country. Sam Tigriano was there from the Browns. Jack Picknell from Boston College. Uh, George Chan from Ohio State. There were, and, but what happened with the, with the football camp, the uh, NCAA came out and won't let those guys come to our camp anymore. That's how all those camps started at the college level. There were no camps when I started at the colleges. None. And then later on, as things that went on, the NCA got involved. They said, oh, those guys are recruiting at my camp, which is crazy. But we did place a lot of guys from their contacts with our camp, but they weren't certainly recruiting. Football camp. Who, uh, you coached professional players, oh, yeah. big-time college kids. Anybody stand out to you uh, among the thousands? I'm, I'm throwing that at you. Uh, not really. There was one. There was a one kid from Kingston. I forget his name. He was real good. But our camp wasn't about that, though. Uh, it wasn't about like who's going to make the big plays. It was about creating an environment where kids could get out of the towns, mm-hmm. come to our camp, learn from the very best, all right, and then go back into their schools. Now our cheerleading camp is different. Our cheerleading camp, the success of that is based on the type of environment that we provide family environment. When they come up there, you know, they're sleeping in cabins, they got to share the showers, they got to communicate. They learn a lot about themselves. Yeah. You put 30 or 40 kids or 20 kids in a cabin, guess what? It's like a pajama party for three nights. And they got, you know, they got to learn to share, they got to learn to share, communicate, and all those things that make a good family. Mm -hmm. And uh, so we're fortunate, but the the cheerleading camp, that's the key to it. It's a family camp environment. But the Pine Forest name has been a magic name for all these well, decades. Well, it's been on since 1968. Yeah. That's 50, 66 years, really. I mean, it's humbling. Like I said, I, yeah. I'm, I know I have my buddies. I got my family. I know where I'm from. And uh, nothing will ever change me in that. No, I won't change. Oh, so let's talk briefly. Mid-Valley becomes a jointure. Correct. Mm-hmm. Jerry Prosciutti is the first coach. First coach. You've got to start a program, merging towns that maybe the kids don't even get along. They didn't even have football. Yeah. Oh, well. When I came to Mid Valley, I left Temple. I wanted to come home because we had two children. I wanted to be back home. So when we started the program, Dixon City dropped it in 1955. Troop dropped it in 1943. I often dropped it in 1962. So when we came in there cold, it was crazy. And, uh, you're talking about trying to put a program together. We had five different practice fields in the in the nine years I was there because they didn't they couldn't get along. No facilities. But I I enjoyed Mid Valley. It was a great opportunity, an opportunity for me to come back. And I actually uh, in the next year, Abington Heights had an opening when Dick Bagley was there. Yeah. And they called me to go there, and I said no. I have a commitment to that community, even though it was a much better program at the time. I felt the loyalty. Yeah. From Mid Valley, what I was said I was going to do, and we created a, a good program there under a tough situation. Yeah. But, uh, the kids that I had an opportunity to coach, they were good kids, and we tried to you know really work hard with them, had great assistance. And another thing I learned a long time ago, you surround yourself with good people. So at my camps, whether it's football or cheering or basketball, I was very very fortunate to surround myself with great coaches and good people who cared. Like we, our family cared, was a projection of our family. So on all those situations at Mid Valley, football camps, security camps, we had surrounded ourselves with good people who really helped make the success of all those camps. Jerry Pesciutti, give us a, 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 just a, a little laundry list of all the other things you did over these years. I mean, <clears throat> I'm going to say this humbly. Very humbly. The football camp was for 44 years. The cheerleading camp was 54 years. I ran a football convention, Coaches Clinic International, coaches from all over the country for 34 years. 
I was the president of the Lackawanna Girls Basketball League for 30 years. Girls Basketball. Girls Basketball. Nobody wanted to do it. I was a young AD then. Uh, I was the president of the Eastern Football Conference for 12 years. And the dream game, I'm still doing it for still 40, doing it. 44 I, years. I saw your picture in the paper. And first of all, you didn't look any older than the first <laughs> I time wish. I met you. But <laughs> you were doing a presentation. And that game has been revived under you, the, the Lions Club. You're doing, you do a remarkable job. 7,000 fans that's came to that much game. every year. Well, that's what happened when I stopped coaching at Mid-Valley. I coached in the 78 game that year, which we won, but great, great kids. And then in 79, I started with the dream game because most of those gentlemen. I wish you had quit a year before. I wouldn't have had to play yeah. against <laughs> Gary <laughs> Yagelski, that yeah, game. Yeah, Gary was our quarterback, team. Alan Muto, Jimmy yeah, Bear. Good, good kids. We were fortunate. But uh, in the dream game, so a lot of those gentlemen didn't know anything about football. So once I got involved, we kind of changed the format of having a, you know, the right jerseys on them having a brunch before the game instead of going to the glider diner and getting two dollars after the game. <laughs> so I was very I the glider. You went to the glider. We all went to the glider I diner. Liked but uh yeah, it was um so that that's been a great thing to keep my keep myself involved with something that meant a lot to me, that dream game, because that's where I got my scholarship from. I had scholarships, but you know, that whole temple thing you know, we already spoke about and, and the rest is history, as they say. Very fortunate, very humbling. You're how old now, Coach? Because you're, you're not ashamed to say it. Ah, I'd be bragging, too. I, I'm 79, <laughs> going to be 80, but yeah, it's just a number. I, I walk every day, you know, try to stay in shape a little bit, but when your number is up, it's up, and uh, I just keep going to do the best I can with it. That's all I can do. But these camps are challenged as you get older. Yeah, you know? I would believe that. Oh, you're dealing with so many uh, individuals, coaches, kids, instructors. It's, uh, but I've Again, I'm surrounded with my two sons. Jerry and Craig take time from their jobs. And they, they'll be coming up here on a Sunday. And then we'll be here till August, uh, August 31st. So it goes in 19 days, three locations. It's exciting. It's like having like 10 football games for me. Oh, for sure. Quite amazing. Yeah, it's just well, been humbling. We're going to continue the conversation with Coach Prosciutti uh, after this on BC TV Extra. You can catch that on YouTube with all of our episodes. Uh, but, Coach, for the WNEP version, uh, we thank you so much for being with us. Well, Bob, I really thank you a lot, respect you a lot, and I really appreciate you know having me on this show and giving me the opportunity to, to, to share what my family's all about and how I had great people around me. And, and I really thank you very much from, from our family, the Prosciutti family. And, Mary, more to come. More to come. Hopefully so. Thank you, Bob. Road Scholar Transport, a higher standard. So we talk about BCTV Extra. This is when we get to go a little bit more in depth on some of the topics. Uh, we've got time limitations on NEP uh, every Sunday at 1130. But, but here we could, we could go a little deeper with uh, our guest. And uh, our Power Brunch Player of the Week this week is Jerry Prosciutti. So, you know, great high school career, great college career, become a college coach, come back and have a, you're a storied high school coach, these amazing pine forest camps that have taken care of kids from all over the region, all over the country, uh, the dream game that is an institution uh, in Northeast Pennsylvania. Uh, let's go back to college for just a minute. Mm -hmm. The um, you got to play for Temple, good solid program. Where were the home games back then? Well, we had our own stadium in North Philadelphia on the campus. No, we had to go up on the end of Broad Street in Mount Airy. Temple had a beautiful bowl stadium. That's where we played. No, you had really? to travel to get there, obviously yeah. by a bus and everything. But we had a great stadium, a great home stadium. Doesn't up. stand today. No, it's gone. It was a community college, and then it's probably housing development now. But when we played, it was a great stadium. It was, you know, nice and you know. Yeah. And uh, don't forget, when I went to college, I was young. I, I played my last year of college ball. I was only twenty. Wow. 
in the last year of high school ball, I was 16. How did that happen? Just I think one. my parents just sent me out of the house. I probably, <laughs> I probably drove them crazy to get him out of here. <laughs> so I went to school very young, and I was just, don't forget, those two years, now kids are 18 that's and 19. That's a big, yeah, that's a when big difference. When you're 16 and 20, it's a big difference. And uh, But, you know, it is what it is, and yeah, that's what all it was. So you played running back running at Temple? Back in, well, we played both ways. Really? Yeah, you had running back okay. and a defensive back. Oh, yeah, at that time when I played, you were a two-way player, not not just one way. Like Chuck Chuck Bednar. Chuck Bednar, <laughs> both ways. But yeah, we played both. You know, a running back and defensive back, and uh, it was challenging. Yeah, no question about it. But it was fun. But what were the teams you played back then? Uh, Bucknell, Boston U, uh, Gettysburg, Delaware, those types of teams. Yeah, and uh, yeah, we had great success. Once in you know, my junior and senior year. You've been ingrained with this the Temple program forever. Uh, you know, I go down to Temple games with Joe Mesco, and I I see you're on, you're on the field. Yeah, we're and, there. We're and, pretty and you, involved. You had a famous friendship with Bill Cosby. Bill Cosby was uh, in 1962, my sophomore year. I was 18. He was 24, six years older, and we were in the same backfield. He was a fullback. I was a running back. And then all those home games, he was my roommate. We stayed at the Philmont Country Club. There were five of us in that room up in the loft. How about that? And uh, but even after a lot of shows that he, you know, he he appeared at, my wife and I went to. Uh, he always acknowledged. I know we were at Coach Hens's down in the Kirby Center, and he was there. And I asked the guy, I said, "Just tell him Jerry Pursuit is here." Well, five minutes later, he stopped the stopped the show. Pursuity, where are you? Gosh, I'm up here with Jeff with Coach Hendricks in the balcony. <laughs> but yeah, he was really funny. Though. We went to a, he entertained us for three weeks that year, every night. Yeah. Camp Shalom, outside of our, actually, both my children, our children live one mile from where we went to football camp for three weeks, right there on Route 29 in Collegeville. But yeah, he, you know, he was our roommate, and, you know, the rest is history, as they say. How do, uh, when you look back at your time at Temple, how do you compare college football of today? And then going back to Blakely, high school football of today versus the times when well, you played. Well, as old coaches as used to say, it's blocking and tackling. Yeah, the plays are different. Uh, we didn't have, a, when I played, we didn't have a weight program. Kids are on a weight program. When we played, uh, you play, I played all three sports, football, basketball, baseball, no, no weight training, mm -hmm. ran on your own, run, run up the mountain and back at the top of the mountain behind <laughs> Richard Toyota. That's what we did. But yeah, uh, but still blocking and tackling. If you notice Penn State now, their, their best play down inside is the straight back, straight back field that you are familiar with, Coach Hedges. Go back to running backs. And uh, yeah, are they more sophisticated? Sure. They, we, we, we couldn't practice till August 18th. Now they have heat conditioning. They practice all summer. They go all out, winter, too. All winter, too. <laughs> they go all year long. So that's changed. But the game of football comes down to blocking and tackling. Yeah. You got you to gotta block, you got to tackle. Is the, is the game of football in any danger? I mean, you got parents that are worried about their kids getting hurt. And I mean, uh, it's. Uh, you know, it's just a different attitude. They're worried about injuries. Well, I think what's happened, Bob, is that there are more distractions today. That's what I call them, distractions. The phones, they have, all, they have other choices they can make rather than going out and playing football and working hard. They can go to other sports that maybe are not as demanding. But there's a lot of distractions. And you have to give credit to these high school football coaches to have the numbers that they have. And some schools have more than others, but still... I think the, the key word is distractions there. Yeah. They have so many things they can get involved with. You know, you have kids, you know, I have grandchildren. I mean, it's a lot of distractions for kids today. And for kids who do play, you have to give them credit because they have a lot of things they can do without playing football. I said, if we had the video games they have, I might have stayed in the basement. <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> instead of getting, <laughs> you know, yelled at by Coach Enzis. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, Video games, you know, I'm not a real tech guy. Yeah. I don't, I'm not real good at technology and all that stuff, so I'm still old school. <laughs> Guys like you, no, you're younger. Well, and... well, tell me about that. We, we talked about it. Is it, 
have the kids changed? Because you're up close and personal with them all well, these years. Part of part of what I share at the camps, the charity camps, I'm, out, I'm asked that question many times. Kids haven't changed. Society's changed. But I still believe, you know, I was a high school principal for about 17 years. I, I believe that if you work with children, with kids, and you tell them how to behave and their expectations, if you make a mistake, we're going to deal with you. And I learned a long time ago, never close the door on a, on a young man or a young woman for discipline because there's a lot of things they can get to, with drugs, alcohol, whatever. You've got to leave that door open so you can get back in. Yeah. But kids are still kids, in my opinion. But I think society's changed. And I think sometimes, sometimes people, older people, feel that, well, they've changed. The kids have changed. I don't believe that. I think kids are still kids. If you, they trust you, you work hard with them, you show them you care about them, like we do at camp. And it's just part of what I speak at camp every that first night. Like this Sunday night, I'll be talking to them things just like this mm -hmm. about, you know, responsibility, character, what you do when no one's watching, all those things we believe in. All right, um, and and I, so I don't think I don't think the kids are different. And and cheerleading, just like basketball, just oh, yeah. like football, requires fundamentals for you to develop. And, well, and, um, and that's probably what you is that what you focus on? There's no question. Uh, you know, it's going to be an Olympic sport. The next Olympics is it? I did not know that. Yeah, it just came out about a month ago. So they're going to be cheerleading in the Olympics. Uh, every year I fly down to UCA Nationals, all right? We had 187 kids down there last year from our camp competing, the things you see on ESPN. Wow. yes, yes, Yeah, yes. we had 187 teams. Uh, so if, if you come and watch a four-day program that we have, cheering is very, very difficult. Those kids go oh, home yeah, tired. Yeah. They're, they're working hard. They're stunting. They're doing cheers. They're doing dance. They put a lot of time in, more than people think. We're a corporate sponsor for the PIA a cheering competition in uh, Hershey, Pine Forest is, mm -hmm. and just we go there, we recruit. There's regionals every weekend from November, and then the big one is in February, the, UC, uh, the UCA Nationals that I go down, spend about a week down every year. Mm -hmm. But it's, they're very demand cheering is tough. They work hard, they stunt, and, and the big thing too coming to our camp, they learn about safety. Coaches, we have coaches meetings. Mm -hmm. We now have what are called master's camps. There's only 14 in the country. We have four of them. Wow. It's a big deal in cheering. They're called master's camps. And uh, so we're, we're humble. Last year we had two. This year they increased it to four. It's a big deal. And just like football, the distractions from hard work and focusing on fundamentals and the practice and the practice and the practice. The young girls are distracted. Girls are doing pretty much the same thing now. And those girls who are part of the cheering that do come to our camp, if you ever saw, like, come this Sunday, we're probably going to have 682 kids in the first session. Um, your old school's coming there. Dumber will be coming to that first session as an example. Um, they work, right? We have demos at 1.30, and they're 2 o'clock, they're at it. And they go hard. You know, they're practicing three times a day. Mm -hmm. And by the time they go home, at noon on that last day, they're tired. Yeah. They work hard. And the, the, the cheerleading has come so far. It's not a little rah-rah anymore. It's a lot of technique. Well, let's talk about your history in the dream game. Uh, you played in it. Played in it. Take us from there. Well, yeah, I played in it. Got the scholarship from it. But then after that, I had the opportunity to... What, was that a Memorial Stadium thing? Yeah. Memorial Big crowd, too. 15,000. Yeah. yeah. Well, I'll tell you what. In 1974, I had an opportunity to coach in the game. I had great talent with Louis Mariani at that time. And then 1978, I had an opportunity to coach again. Fortunately, there were two wins. Yeah. Yeah, because you had great kids, obviously. Make you look good as a coach when you have good players. You were the county guy. With county guys. Yeah. And then both our children, both Jerry and Craig, played in it. So we have a lot of history with the dream game. Yeah, very special game. I still have my jersey. Yeah, I'll bet you fit in it if you want. I don't fit in it, but, but, I, but <laughs> it shrunk, but, though, not Bob, because you grew. But Bob, I, I bring it out every year at the brunch. Every year I have that jersey, and yeah. I tell them what this. Jersey, what was the number, Coach? Eleven, and I, I tell them what this jersey meant to me as a kid and how I got the scholarship from the game, yeah. and you know the rest is history. But I, every now, time, give, we, us, give us part of that. What you say? Well, when I when I get up there in front of these teams, you know, we talk about the game and. We, 
And then the, I come, well, what the reason I'm so involved in this game is because of this jersey. You know, the guy will say, well, what do you mean? And then I said, it's because of this jersey. I had an opportunity to go to college, number one, because my father couldn't afford it. That's one. But then from there, I started a football camp, a cheerleading camp, coached at Temple, had an opportunity to recruit a lot of guys. And uh, don't give it away. I said, yeah. cherish that jersey because there's only so many times in your life that you could be part of something special. Yeah. And this game is special. And that's why this jersey is special to me. And I'm, I'm an older guy. Coach, let's go back to something you mentioned during the, the balance of the show. Your father, coal miner, hardworking. He gets to see his son on scholarship oh, yeah. at Temple University. We touched on it, but yeah. man, what a... That, well, it, it, it gives me... For me... My eyes glisten thinking about it because oh, yeah. that had to be amazing. It was uh, a lot of humbling. Kids, a lot of kids didn't even go to college back no. then. I was but they have one. come from a humble work, real working class oh, yeah. family. In working class. We lived above our parents, my grandparents. When I was 12, I had to move out. My brother was born. And my father was so involved with the, with the youth of Tecla. And uh, he coached all those teams. Uh, he was also on the chains, which meant he was the leading rusher at Blakely. Anybody at Blakely will tell you, who was the leading rusher in Blakely's history? It was my dad. He used to say the rosary on the chains. There was no marking. We played Dunmore in 1959. We were losing 18-0. We came back 20-18 with Joe Morelli and Billy Harcher and Art Manuel and those guys, the yeah. names that you would remember. Good team. And uh, they had fourth and about one, and they didn't get it. I think my father said the rosary. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. So he, 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 he only missed me play one game. And the game we played Boston, Boston University, and had a great game. Had two long touchdown runs, a 95 yarder, 65 yard, blah, blah, blah. And then it was on national TV, you know, how they had the recaps of the games. Yeah. Well, he picked up the game where he's buried now on the top of Jessup Mountain. He picked up the Philadelphia station, and he had my kid sister in the car. She was real young then. And he, that's the only game he missed me play. He was at every game freshman game, varsity game. He drove down and saw me play and coach. You have to be very proud of the continuity of family oh, in question. your sports career oh, yeah. from, from player to coach to, to your own family, your wife and your, your sons being involved in your camp, oh, yeah. uh, camps. Mm -hmm. uh, well, that's I, unique. When I look back, it's all about family for me because, you know, the way we were brought up, we didn't have much, but most of the guys and most of the people in the town were pretty much the same. But uh, my dad, he was just so, he just made it a point to, to, to keep me involved. I played everything. And he was at everything. He never missed me playing except that one game in college in 1964. But other than that, he was at every game. And uh, coming from that type of environment, I learned what family means. I learned what a hard, hard work hard, not to alibi, not to make excuses. If something goes wrong, you don't put your head in the sand, you face it, you move on, and you get better for it. Mm -hmm. And that's the heart of our camps. It's families run camp. We're the only camp in the country, United States, that's family run. They're all run by the college varsity. It's a corporation. They're they're all at colleges all over the country. Mm -hmm. And uh, we're not. We're at these camps up here. And the, the other part of this is that when you look back, you look, yeah, I'm going to say this with humility. We have more children than any camp in the country by far. Mm -hmm. But that doesn't change how we operate. We're mm -hmm. still humbled, we still run it if it was in our own town there, and making sure that the kids who come there, and another thing I tell them too, for a lot of those children who come, we get them from a lot of inner city kids who come to our camp, that's their vacation. Yeah. They don't go on vacation. I never went on a vacation in my life as a kid growing up. There's nobody. You went to Chapman Lake. That's pretty much as far as you went. And it's rustic. Uh, well, these great, camps are great these, scenting. These, these, these camps are pretty, pretty, uh, High-end camps for the summer camps. I mean, they're good camps. The facilities are great. You know, the cabins are great. If you're uh, out in the middle of woods. You're in the middle of nowhere. No, yeah. Beautiful sense. Well, we got a team driving up from Florida or outside of Orlando. Oh, they're driving up. They were going to fly in, but they're, they're going to come at 3.30 in the morning on August 23rd. When they go down that last mile of road, right, the 
trails end road for a mile and they're going to they're not getting there till 11 o'clock at night so it's pitch dark and then all of a sudden they're in a camp and that's the beauty of it at minnetonka high school flies in every year they fly mm -hmm. in a scrant they rent vans but for the first teams that come for the first time part of my speech like then on a sunday how many are still in shock here because you're in the middle of nowhere but i tell them you know what i tell them bob these are special trees these, these are pine forest trees a special, I said, you're in a special place now, and we're going to work hard to ensure that you have a positive experience and leave here looking back and say, I had a great time. But more importantly, I learned about myself my, and my team by living with them in those cabins. That's really a, a big factor for us. I know you don't like to talk about it, but uh, what about Jerry Prosciutti? How, how would you like to be remembered? And that would be a significant player in the sports world. How would you like to be thought of, remembered? I would like to be thought of just being Jerry, coming from a humble background, great family, my family and the family I came from, and that he cared about people. He cared about what he was doing as a person. And uh, that's all I wanted. If, I, if there's any memory, it's just Jerry. Jerry, who uh, came from a good family, has a good family, and create an environment where we had an impact on a lot of people in a positive way. And nothing, nothing fancy. I'm just, I was interviewed when the teams from Ireland come over here, Bob, in 2019. This is their fourth time. And the, the young lady who was interviewing me on Channel 16, well, she said, Jerry, what's your title? I looked her right at her. I said, there's no title. I'm just Jerry. She, like, <laughs> she almost she couldn't say anything. You didn't know what to, how to respond to that. So if, as far as myself, I'm Jerry from Peckville. I got a you know good family. I have a couple of buddies, good friends, you know, and that's all I'll be remembered, hopefully, in a positive way. Jerry Pesciutti, great to be with you. Great to Thanks, talk Scott. to you and, and have everybody find out what a lot of us already know. I appreciate it. Thanks, Thanks so much, Don. Take care. Pleasure. Yep. Thank you. Thanks for being part of the program. You've got an appointment every Sunday morning at 1130 right here on WNEP-TV. The Bob Cordaro Show on TV. Now we'll fight for you the pursuit of justice and liberty. It's the 